Well, folks, we have some Sunken City cards to review, and a lot of them, in fact. Uh, there's only one card coming out today, so I saved up some from last night, which means we get to take a look here at the Blackwater Behemoth, the new Priest Colossal Minion. It's a big old 8 mana, 8 10, and it has Life Steal. On top of that, the appendage that it's summoning is its little lure. That's a 2 mana, 1 4. At the end of your turn, force a random enemy minion to attack the Blackwater Behemoth. So essentially here, this is a way to get a guaranteed lifesteal attack out of your Blackwater Behemoth, assuming your opponent has a minion on board. So it's doing a couple things, right? It's often clearing something on your opponent's side of the board. It's got that kind of Ragnaros or Troublemaker or even like Abominable Lieutenant effect where it might be removing something. Uh, on top of that, it's probably healing you for eight Theoretically, more if you buff this, but very often a nice little heal for eight. So it's removal, it's healing, and it's a pretty big minion. Now, the minion will take damage, unlike some of those other examples that I named. So you might be left with like an 8-5 left over if it, say, were to clear a 5-5 five, five minion, or maybe just like an 8-2 if it took out an 8-8. Eight, eight. So you're not likely to get a ton of incremental value off of the Behemoth in future turns. Also, the Behemoth's lore is probably pretty easy for your opponent to deal with by the time you get to eight mana. So you're kind of hoping to take that one big stabilization turn, remove their threat, get some healing off the back of this, and still maybe force your opponent to react to whatever's left over for your behemoth, because it is almost always going to value trade across most minions, of course. So that is a lot of stuff, but it's all still at 8 mana, and sometimes that 8 healing won't be enough that late into the game. And, you know, if your opponent's a combo deck, may not matter at all. They may not even have any minions to interact with at all. So this is a little bit dependent on context and situation, I think, to be a great card. But as soon as we get into a board-based meta, and if Priest can go long, which Priest historically has been very good at playing later into games, I do think the Behemoth starts to make a lot more sense could maybe be something like even the eight drop at the end of a quest line priest as well it makes a lot of sense there i do think there are a couple different angles for this card to get tossed in it's just that eight mana not every deck's gonna be able to afford to run this thing it will take those select builds for it to make sense all right and next up we have a bonkers card uh this one's freshly translated but i watched the video this is how it works after you cast a spell deal damage equal to its cost to the enemy hero. So this is a two mana, two, three for hunters. So yes, you spend two mana to plop this guy down. Then if you cast a piercing shot, this guy is going to deal four damage to the enemy hero on top of whatever the piercing shot does. If you cast an aim shot, it's going to deal an extra three damage to the enemy hero. If you throw in a dragon shot, dragon bane shot, it's another two damage to the enemy hero. So basically all of these crazy burst damage spells getting like double or more damage output essentially with this two mana overhead cost, which needless to say, two mana is not a lot if you're weaving multiple spells into a turn and doing ridiculous damage. When combined with Quest Hunter, which is already a good deck, this looks absolutely crazy bonkers good. Like it's gonna pump out so much ridiculous damage for only two mana and a deck that's already trying to do exactly that very effectively. I don't even know how this is possible. It seems way too scary strong to me. And uh, it's just free bonus damage in Hunter and they love damage. So uh, there's, you know, potential Naga synergy upside as well, but I don't think you need it. This guy's just nutty on his own and it only takes a couple spells to really make this one worth it. Particularly when you're ready to close out a game, this can really amp up the damage very, very quickly. Next up for Priest here is Switcheroo. This is a fun little spell. Just such cute art. My God, there's some cute art we're going to talk about in this one. It's a three meta spell. It draws you two minions and then it swaps their stats. So some definite meme potential here. All kinds of uh, darkness memes getting tossed out there with a stone tusk boar. Draw those and you get a one mana 2020 charge minion. If you're playing in wild format like is that a meme? Maybe, maybe not. That actually might be halfway decent, which is like a spell deck built around it. In standard format, I don't expect quite so many shenanigans where you're getting some kind of crazy charge damage, but you could still utilize that same swap where you have a low-cost minion 
that gets a bunch of stats and maybe it has some kind of cool effect, whether that's as simple as rush or like a big taunt lifesteal. There are still some ways to swap those stats up and get you a really high tempo, low cost minion with a lot of pressure or value coming out of it. Now that does leave you left over with potentially a high cost minion with terrible stats. So there is some downside there, but it might just be game winning enough to get that really cheap one with big stats that it doesn't matter what you're left over with. Now on the other side of things, I think this is just a good card draw card. Tutoring two minions out of your deck, even if their stat swapping isn't particularly relevant or desirable, maybe it's just on average kind of a wash. Um, that might just be good because you really care about finding minions. We've already seen priests do that a lot with cards like Insight, where they're just happy to draw minions. This gets you two for three mana, so it's a specific card draw effect that has that old arcane intellect efficiency pattern. That's that's historically been pretty good, and for priests, a class that can sometimes let card draw, I think that's going to be fine for a lot of decks who don't even care about the stat swap, and then very occasionally you're going to have decks that really care about the stat swap and do something super cool based on that. So I think this card has a ton of utility. Next up here is more just amazingly cute artwork. This is Flipper Friends. This expansion's a weird mix. There's a lot of like kind of dark and epic and awesome scenes and characters, and there's all these just ridiculously cute ones. Anyway, this is a five mana spell for Druid, and it's a nature spell. Choose one, summon a six six orca with taunt or six one one otters with rush and uh, i actually like this spell a lot i think this is going to be really solid for a couple reasons historically druid's been great with these wide board summon sorts of cards uh, i mean even recently with a uh, scale of onyxia summoning all the whelps uh, we've had things in the past like uh glow flies getting summoned at five mana it's good if you can build wide boards over and over again when you have ways to leverage those wide boards with buffs. Now, cards like Arbor Up are leaving, so we might not have quite as good of a wide board package that we had historically, but we've got like two years to find one for this card to make sense eventually. I'm sure at some point Blizz uh, Blizzard will give Druid more wide board follow-ups that make these board builders really good. Now, admittedly, these one ones aren't quite as sturdy as like Glowfly Swarms, they don't have quite the reactivity of scale of Anixia because they're one attack instead of two. So there is a little bit of a gap there, but it's more consistent than Glow Fly Swarm because you're getting six bodies every time and it's cheaper than scale. So you can play it faster. Also, of course, this is another meaty spell for uh, the Hedra Naga card that, that uh, summons minions based on spell class. So this is like a nice five drop in the pool there. On top of that, this has choose one synergies and there's this like choose one package stuff that Blizzard keep printing for druid as well we've got a few in the last couple sets so i think there's like seven different ways this card actually makes a ton of sense across different uh druid decks and i haven't even talked about the six six taunt sometimes in a pinch that could be really nice if you're just uh, not ready to like turn the corner and build your board yet but you need a little bit of defensive utility boom go for the six six taunt and then sometimes you get all of them because you've gotten this doubled up off of a choose one synergy card so I think this card can do a lot of different things. It's reactive, it's fast, it fits archetypes that have historically been good. Synergies with new cards. I don't know how you go wrong with this one. So next up here, let's talk about the Piranha Swarmer. This is a new one mana, one, one rush neutral. And it reads, after you summon a Piranha Swarmer, gain plus one attack. So a little bit of self synergy here. And uh, on its own, that doesn't sound that exciting, but there are apparently going to be a handful of different cards that have ways to give you Piranha Swarmers. So far, we've only seen one. It's this guy, the Piranha Poacher, which gives you a Piranha Swarmer at the end of your turn that you have to play for one mana. But there may be others. I don't know if they're going to be in Shaman or across a variety of classes, but this is, you know, a little cycle of cards that all work together, essentially. And theoretically, that means you have some upside here where you can make these like two ones or three ones and, you know, react to your opponent's boards. But ultimately, I, I think actually hard running these and like committing to that entire thing is it's just not going to be worth it. Um, there are other ways to react to opponent's boards that seem to be uh, much more efficient, maybe uh, for like Druid or Hunter, where they can extract some extra beast synergies out of this. I could see a little bit more potential where they like tokens, they like rush minions, they like beasts, and you get this kind of critical mass of upsides. But for the average deck and for like Shaman, for instance, I don't see why you would need to run all these Piranha Swarmers. They're probably just 
better tools that achieve the same sort of thing. So for me, I mean, this is not a card you'd run on its own. It's just two of them. Clearly the upside's not going to be there for this one. So you got to commit to this big package. And that's a risk that most decks just won't want to commit that many cards to. So let's go ahead and talk about the Piranha Poacher since we mentioned it. This is a three mana two five Murloc for Shaman. It reads at the end of your turn, add a one one Piranha Swarmer to your hand. Now, I will say, I think this card has its own sort of strengths that aren't necessarily dependent on the Piranha Swarmer because this is a pretty solid Murloc body and we've still got some Murloc stuff lingering around in Shaman that might be a potential archetype for that class moving forward. And having big bodies like this has historically been good when Murlocs synergize with each other on board. So it's sticky to proc future Murloc synergies. It might absorb certain kinds of buffs and continue to snowball on this five health total to begin with. And then all along the way, you're getting this just kind of mana filler, Piranha Swarmer, or maybe stacking a couple up in hand that are a free resource. Unlike the Piranha Swarmer, you gotta run. I don't know if you gotta run additional ones for the Piranha Poacher to make sense. It might be good to just get these cards in hand. Kind of reminds me of like lackeys of old, obviously much lower quality on average, but they're sort of freebies in a way if you're already doing successful Murloc stuff. Now that means this is probably very reliant on Murloc Shaman to be good, which we have no guarantees that will ever happen, but it's still a potentially useful tool in that potential archetype. So the other Shaman card here is the Scalding Geyser. It's a one mana fire spell. It deals two damage and it has dredge. And I think it's really, really good. I think this does a couple things for Shaman. Number one, it's burst damage. It can go face and two might not be that exciting, but remember Shaman has a lot of ways to get spell damage into play. And there's already really successful burn Shaman decks that are dumping a bunch of spell damage and a lot of cheap burn. And this can slot really perfectly into that already good shell for burn Shaman. And the fact that it's a fire spell is really important for multicaster. That gives them a very fitting synergistic fire spell to activate multicaster. So it just, again, fits into the card draw uh, options for that deck as well, enabling them to get um, a very easy fire trigger for that multicaster to draw them an additional card. So it's just a really good fit. On top of that, it's got dredge. So you're actually increasing the quality of your next draw very often. Maybe you dredge up that multicaster after getting the fire spell in, and then you're good to go to reload next turn. And of course, in a pinch can be used to react to minions as needed and just slot into turns at one mana. So really powerful card that fits good decks already and solves some real problems as a fire spell. So I think this is very good. Next up, we'll talk about some Paladin cards. This is the Seafloor Savior, a two mana two two mech who's got the cutest little turtle it's saving. It's got a Band-Aid on its shell of all things. It reads Battlecry Dredge. If it's a minion, give it this minion's attack and health. So an interesting little hand buff sort of card here. You play your two two on two and then you find a great minion maybe to fill in your curve or just a really powerful legendary you're looking for for later. And you're going to give it a really nice health buff, which of course in Paladin or not just health attack as well, which in Paladin is great for things like Divine Shield minions or Rush minions. You could hit a Sidan to make it a six six uh, on curve following this up like that seems like a really neat play on top of that uh, since it's giving it this minions attack and health if you buff this minions attack and health in hand using any sort of hand buff stuff uh, like an alliance bannerman for instance then it's going to scale that buff up to the next minion as well that it dredges so um, pretty cool i think this is one of the more reasonable looking dredge cards I've seen so far. A lot have felt a little underwhelming, but because this is passing along a buff and doing things that Paladin already likes to do pretty well, I think it makes a ton of sense. Next up for Paladin is Immortalized in Stone, a seven mana holy spell. It's gonna summon you a one, two, a two, four, and a four, eight sea guardian with taunt. And uh, I'm, I'm really torn on this card. Normally I like, uh, any card that can summon a big pile of stuff, I think that's usually pretty solid in Hearthstone. And since these all have taunt, that could be very awkward for certain decks to deal with. That 4-8 in particular is pretty substantial. 
even at seven mana, that's a, a solid body. And you got these sort of lingering uh, one, two and two, four bodies next to it as well. That might just kind of stick around or really interrupt your opponent's flow in regards to trades and things. This is also a holy spell. And we've seen a lot of holy spell synergy cards thus far. Now, this is not one that would synergize particularly well with Kotori because that's all about targeting him with spells. This is obviously not a targeted spell, but this could be a discount on uh, the big 10 mana spell that we saw. So you could have something like play this for seven. Uh, maybe you've played a couple spells earlier and then, you know, you buff one of these with five, five and divine shield. And that's pretty nice. Like, I think that's a lot of stuff. And again, it's it's annoying to push through. But I worry a lot of the times at seven mana, it might just be too late. I, I you know, if you're sitting on a, a seven mana spell in hand and a 10 mana spell in hand in that situation, and maybe some other holy stuff in hand. I don't know if you're going to be able to swing it back hard enough off of a play like this one when other decks are just either smorking you super hard with face damage or setting up combo finishers they're going to have in a couple turns. So I don't know if this develops enough threat uh, or alternatively enough defensive utility. So I love cards like this. Like I'm obviously going to try to make this work. Like this is exactly what I want Hearthstone to be. But I do worry that the... Uh, Poli Paladin package as it's coming along right now. It's just a little bit too late game centered and it's not swingy enough in that late game profile. Like it needs to do more dramatic things and this doesn't feel that dramatic to me. Kotori doesn't feel that dramatic to me. It feels like it's all about stats and it's kind of straight up and honest. It doesn't feel like it's cheating quite enough. So despite being things that I love, I'm still not totally convinced of this Paladin package getting there. It seems like it's gonna be a hair too slow. So let's move on to Mage here with the Mecha Shark. I don't know if this guy's gonna to be too slow. He's a three mana, four, three mech. And it reads, after you summon a mech, deal three damage randomly split among all enemies. So this has some major Flame Waker vibes where you're uh, able to ping off a bunch of stuff if you're playing a ton of mechs. And I'm very scared for that in wild format with cards like Mech Warper. Now this review is not gonna touch on that. That might be crazy OP. In standard format, I doubt we'll have as much mech cost reduction where you can really like play five things alongside of this and just like completely melt your opponent's face or board. Cause note this does say enemies, not enemy minions. But I do still think there's some potential here because if any kind of card comes along that summons like micro bots of old where you get maybe three one one mechs, this is a really big swing because it's nine damage in that case. And even just a couple small mechs is enough to make this worth it for that, say, like six damage of ping that can either go face. So uh, we've got a few mech mage things happening already. We've seen two uh, mech synergy cards for mage. Seems like there are going to be more. Uh, that might be an archetype that doesn't get off the ground right away uh, because it just needs enough mech. So maybe a few expansions down the line, they get a couple more and it starts to make sense. But this seems like the kind of card that could totally make that worth it, where you play this on like turn five or six and it really pulls a game back into your favor or just does a ton of damage after you've already swarmed with early game mechs. So it has some lethality and swing potential, both of which I think are really important for cards these days. So obviously we'll need the right stuff to support it, but a lot of potential in this one. All right, next up for Mage is Gifts of Ashara, a two mana arcane spell. It draws you a card, and if you play a Naga while holding this, you get to do it again. So uh, best case scenario, the ceiling for this is two mana draw two, which is certainly good. Uh, a lot of classes would be very happy with that. For Mage, I'll admit, it seems a little underwhelming compared to the crazy card draw they've had. Uh, in recent metas, you know, cram session is draw 27 <laughs> for, for two mana. So I, it does feel a little underwhelming of note, but historically draw two for two is pretty solid for a lot of classes. That said, that is the ceiling. I, I think there's going to be a lot of instances where this actually feels really underwhelming, even in a Naga deck, because like if you got two mana to spend on two, maybe you haven't played a Naga yet. It's like, man, this sucks. This is just two mana draw one. So it's going to be chilling in hand waiting until that Naga comes out, which maybe makes it more mid game based. Uh, on top of that, it's only going to make sense if you have Naga in your deck, which of course not all decks will have Naga forever for mage. There might be one or two that pop up early and this is a reasonable card, but I don't think it's ever going to be an amazing card 
that's like, oh, no, they got gifts of Ashara. Oh, no. I think it's just kind of fair for mage these days. So moving on here to the Baba Naga. This is a new four mana, four, four neutral Naga. It is not the Baba Yaga. It's the Baba Naga. This is very confusing to my brain. But the battle card reads, if you've cast a spell while holding this, deal three damage. And I've tried to like a lot of cards like this in recent uh, expansions where these sorts of things have been released and they never really seem to pan out. So I'm gonna shift gears and now say this one's probably gonna have the same problem. It's just maybe not going to do quite enough or fit a specific enough game plan where decks really need to run this. It's one of those cards where it looks fine, you discover it, it's maybe fine. Uh, you know, I was gonna say in arena it's maybe fine, but actually the spell condition might be tough in arena particularly. <laughs> so it's just not exciting enough to really make the cut in any specific direction it also has that same top deck problem where if you get this off the top and don't have a spell ready to go or don't want to commit the mana to a spell might be actually a little bit harder to play this one so uh it's one of those cards that's like totally fine back in the old days this would have been so exciting but nowadays just doesn't seem to make the cut moving on to the crush claw enforcer this is a three mana three four naga battle cry if you've cast a spell while holding this draw a naga so <laughs> give me those nagas dude uh, getting the sort of building blocks here of a Naga deck with a Naga tutor. So I guess if you need to achieve a critical mass of Nagas, a card like this absolutely makes some sense. Uh, just toss it in vanilla stats, some draw upside. That has been a fine recipe for success in the past. I could also see this actually as a Naga tutor where you don't run a ton of Naga, but there's one specific one you need, say like uh, Hedra and Druid is like your big, you know, board bomb and you just kind of run a couple of these and whatever naga you care about and that is also utility as a tutor as opposed to fuel for a naga deck now that said this isn't like an especially exciting card it has that same limitation if you top deck this it's not great to play right away it kind of has to chill in hand for a while uh if you want to play it on curve even like have you played a spell by turn three maybe quest deck solve that problem pretty easily but otherwise maybe you're playing minions early and it's kind of awkward just a few friction points there to get these Naga into play as consistently and as reliably, I think, as many people would like earlier in the game. So next up here is the Cutlass Courier for uh, Rogue. It's a three mana, two five pirate. The artwork is freaking sick. This guy looks awesome. I got this like super epic art like this for a common card. He could easily be a legendary. I'd be like, oh, that's some super sick legendary guy. Uh, and then we've also got this super cute fish all over the place. A very big mix there. But this reads, after your hero attacks, draw a pirate. And uh, that's intriguing. We haven't seen Rogue necessarily need a lot of super consistent pirate draws. We haven't seen a pirate Rogue in a long time. But that's that's a great little engine, right? Good body on board at five health. Could easily stick around for a couple turns. You've got your weapon on two naturally via hero power to make sure you're able to activate this thing consistently. So this could be a nice early to mid game draw two develop some tempo sort of card. On top of that, there are some pretty key pirates for Rogue to draw with things like Edwin and Smite. So even if you don't run a ton of pirates, this might still be a good way to tutor out a few really strong ones. So a couple of these, Edwin and Smite, that's a nice little draw package for some big payoffs uh, with two cards with a ton of lethality, particularly when combined together. So I think this card's actually pretty cool. I wouldn't get trapped up on all the pirate trappings um it's just a couple or really all you need to make it make sense and it fits really naturally i think into the rogue curve all right next up here is the twin bow terror coil a new naga for hunter and pretty crazy effect battle cry if you've cast a spell while holding this your next spell casts twice so a solar eclipse on a body but notably this can be used on a future turn it doesn't have to be this turn like solar eclipse so for instance you could drop this on four and then aimed shot and hero power on five for a billion damage the actual damage is what aim shot deals three that's doubled so that's six but it's also adding four damage to your hero power for another six that's 12 damage immediately following this up on turn five uh and that's, of course, crazy. Uh, there's just so many spells in Hunter that I, I think eventually you're going to just get there on this most of the time, whereas other decks might be weaving in more minions. So things like Quest Hunter especially have a lot of ways for spells uh, that are cheap to weave in, activate this thing, and then set off for that big punch to the face 
whenever that might be. On top of that, if Hunter does get any like crazy summoning spells where it's like five mana, summon a bunch of minions or a big minion, doubling it up is another way for this to get good in a less face oriented deck, but still just extracting extra value out of some kind of high powered spell. So next up here is the Black Scale Brute for Warrior, a seven mana five, six Naga. It's got Taunt on its own and Battlecry. If you have a weapon equipped, you also get a five, six Naga with Rush. So with that weapon up, this is two pretty nice bodies, uh, one that can react immediately and then one that has some defensive potential here thanks to the taunt. And um, this is one of those cards that's, I think, fine, um, which a few years ago you'd been like, what? This is so insane. I don't think it's actually all that that powerful these days, though. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, OK, sure, an arena if you land this, like you're going to be super happy and constructed kind of like that Paladin spell at seven mana. I'm not sure this really does enough, big enough stuff to really win you a game. So I don't think it's great when it goes well. And I actually think this uh, weapon condition is a little more challenging than I've seen other people comment on. Sometimes you don't want to play a weapon on six. So it's like, oh man, that didn't line up super well. I have to make this awkward play, just to make this guy good in the future. Or maybe you're hanging on to a weapon for too long that you played earlier when you need to use it to gain tempo now. Alternatively, maybe you set that weapon up on six, your opponent just destroys it. They have uh, a Viper and it's gone, and now your Black Scale Brute is just completely stranded. So I don't think that's that friendly of a condition to achieve. It's not it's certainly impossible, it will absolutely happen, but there's still some risk inherent to that. And I don't think the payoff is all that great when it does work. It's good, but not amazing. So for me, the Black Scale Brute definitely has some problems. And even when it works well, I don't know if it's enough these days. It might just be a little too honest. All right, so next up here is Multi-Strike, a one mana fell spell for Demon Hunter. It gives your hero plus two attack this turn, and it reads, they may attack an additional enemy minion. So, seen a little bit of confusion about this text. I agree, it's a little bit confusing. My takeaway is that this is essentially your hero has Wind Fury and plus two attack, of course, but you can only attack face once. So you can't like hit for four to face, but you could do two to face and two to a minion, or you could do two to a minion and another two to a separate minion. Uh, if you wanted to say like clear two, two health minions with it, there is still a little confusion there about the ordering. Can you attack a minion and then attack face? I think so, but I could definitely interpret it both ways. So uh, confusing wording here. All the same, this is a pretty high output card. Uh, it's just a good attack buff for one mana. We've seen cards like this succeed anyway. Uh, just helping you like clean up your opponent's stuff early that they play. And it can kind of be a cleave as well, taking out two things at once. It's also a fell spell. So this is just burst damage and a Jace later. Jace is being played a fair bit. And uh, another early game kind of response tool that then turns into burst damage seems like a good fit for Jace. So I think this is a totally solid card. It's not going to knock anybody's socks off, but uh, definitely can fit in some Jace decks. And then finally here we have the Excavation Specialist, a four mana, three, six neutral with Battlecry Dredge and reduce its cost by one. So uh, this is my weakest card of the set so far, I think. I just don't really see this one making a lot of sense. So you're putting, uh, you know, a good card on the top of your deck with Dredge. You're reducing its cost by one. That is not the kind of cost reduction that Hearthstone has seen succeed. Spending four mana to reduce the cost of something by one. Doesn't even draw you a card. I mean, the body on board is not exciting. You used to be able to set a three six is pretty reasonable, but it's just not enough these days. So uh, I just don't know how this keeps up with the crazy pace of modern Hearthstone. Blackwater Behemoth is a three star card. This Hunter Legendary Naga, whose name I don't know yet, is a five-star card. Switcheroo is a four-star card. Flipper Friends is a four-star card. Piranha Swarmer is a two-star card. Seafloor Savior is a four-star card. Immortalized in Stone is a three-star card. Mecha Shark is a four-star card. Gifts of Ashara is a two-star card. Baba Naga is a two-star card. Crush Claw Enforcer is a three-star card. Scalding Geyser is a five star card. Piranha Poacher is a three star card. Cutlass Courier is a four star card. Twinbow Terror Coil is a four star card. Black Scale Brute is a two star card. Multi Strike is a three star card. Excavation Specialist is a one star card.
And there you go, folks. That wraps it up for this review. Lots of cards to discuss. What do you think about these? What do you like? What do you hate? What are you excited to play? I want to hear all those thoughts and more in the comments below. But until then, thanks so much for watching. And until next time, game on.